So Tatiana, you are an Oscar nominee for your work on I, Tanya. Um, I I'm curious, I mean, when you first uh, were approached about this project, what were your expectations like for a movie about Tanya Harding? Well, actually, when Craig, the director, um, first called me about it, I was, I was, uh, I, I had a little bit of a deflation in an odd way. I kind of was like, hmm, really? Tanya Harding? I just couldn't imagine. Um, I couldn't, Im I, I definitely did not imagine this film. And sort of what I initially imagined, I think, is a lot what many people might think it is um, about the film. And it's a story that, you know, it may be my initial feeling was I didn't have much of an interest. And then I read the script and I completely understood uh, what Craig was going to be going for and got extremely excited about doing it. So the interesting thing about the movie is that uh, it balances tone very well. Um, I mean, it's very, very funny at times and then very, very uh, hard to watch and serious. Um, can you talk about, as the editor, how you were able to... Uh, balance those two tones. I mean, there's it's yeah. such extreme tonal shifts in the movie. Yeah, that, well, that was one of the things that really attracted uh, me to, to the script, and but also the thing that I really love about Craig Gillespie, the director, and I, I've worked with him now. This is the fifth film that I've done with him uh, over the last 10 years, and I really, really appreciate that about him. I think it's a difficult, um, those are they're very difficult elements to bring into a film to have these tonal shifts and to be able to walk that line It's a it's a delicate dance. I think it, it The first time I worked with him was on Lars and the real girl and I think we accomplished it there And it was very fun and very challenging and with I Tanya, the same thing. It's it, it's a very um, emotional and tragic story and yet extremely funny and just absurd um, a lot of it and I think the the main way that that we approached it that I really like is to always go for the reality, you know, go for the truth, and always sort of take the straight line with something like that because the story brings in the comedy and everything in a very natural way because it's true. Like the craziest parts of the story that you kind of, if you were if you were reading it or or even when we would have screenings, people would say, oh, well that that bodyguard isn't for real, is he? Or like Google it, Google it, you'll see it's verbatim. Um, so that all of that humor was sort of naturally brought in by the absurdity. Then there was also the script, which brought the, this, um, these uh, different opinions and different stories, you know, Tanya's or Jeff's um, telling of this story, which, which were wildly contradictory, um, which is just a fascinating way of telling a story. Is there an example, a, a certain scene that you could point to uh, as an example of uh, that the, the challenge of balancing those two tones, one that was like particularly difficult for you to to uh, tackle? Um, well, it's sort of a, it, it's it's a spine that goes through the whole film. So I don't know if I can talk about a specific scene. I think one of the scenes that I really like a lot is the is the scene where. Um, Tanya and Lavana are having dinner together, and this uh, argument escalates. Um, and her mother ends up picking everything off the table and heaving it at her. And the last thing she picks up and throws is a knife. And and the scene starts off very quiet, and the, it has this very natural escalation and tension that gets built into it, ending with this knife throw. And every single time we screened it, the audience would gasp, and and it was just always fun to watch that. Um, and then there's this tension that's drawn out at the end where you're trying to, um, y you know, each character doesn't know what the other is going to do and the audience doesn't know what they're going to do. And then it is broken with this ridiculous comic line of, of Alice and Janney's about, well, all families have, you know, problems, um, which I just, I love that, that breaking of the tension at that point. I just think it's, it's just wonderful. And so that's the stance that we did throughout the whole film where there are these peaks and valleys um, where you wind up this tension and then you release it, whether it's the abuse, you know, these, these scenes where, uh, where she's getting hit by either her mother or her husband, boyfriend, and then husband, um, and it's, it's harsh and we didn't want to sugarcoat it at all. Um, but then it, it, and, but then it has this absurdity and this comic element that gives the audience a little bit of a relief, um, to send, then move on to the next painful scene. 
That scene you just talked about is actually one I was thinking about when you were yeah. <laughs> talking. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Um, it's also, a, uh, obviously, since Tanya Harding uh, is a figure skater, um, you have a lot of sequences of her skating, and uh, they're very uh, carefully orchestrated sequences. Can you talk a bit about editing uh, those? Yeah, they were they were really fun. I think that's one of the things that's unique about this film also, because, you know, as an editor, you often... Um, you can get typecast very easily as somebody who does comedy or drama or action or whatever. This film has the kitchen sink in it. And I think it's fascinating that way. It's, you know, it has those quiet dialogue scenes and then it has, you know, four or five of these big skating sequences, um, which were really fun to put together. You know, they had, they were obviously choreographed and based on her original skating um, that she did. Um, and then choreographed with Craig and the, and the uh, cinematographer about how it was going to be shot and everything. And then in the cutting room, we really had to come up with these, uh, each, each sequence had its own identity and personality. The ones earlier in the film are particularly the very first one, the ZZ Top one, is um, very aggressive and young and attitude and fast. And, and, and then the one at the very end at Lilyhammer is um, tense and it's all in one shot. Uh, and you know that we've gone through this whole sequence with the shoelace, and and you hear the stadiums, you know, stomping their feet, and the clock is ticking down, and all these had to happen. So each skating se sequence had its own personality, and um, and it was really really fun. Not only just to cut the fun skating and the you know these jumps and this and that, but um, but to really give it a, a, a depth and and character in and of itself. You mentioned the music, and that's another thing the movie does really well, is uh, it, it has a, a wonderful soundtrack. <laughs> um, were you cutting to music? I mean, can you talk about how you uh, cut music uh, to images to music? Yeah, I didn't, well, in the script, uh, there was no music written into the script at all. That's something that Craig brought to it. Uh, which I really liked. He mentioned it very early on, and he wanted it, um, he, he he wanted to bring a lot of energy uh, to the film that way. I mean, there is a lot anyway, just in the way it was written in lots of scenes. I think there are 260 some odd scenes in the film. Um, but he knew that that music would not only do what it always does emotionally and setting a timestamp and um, stuff like that, but it, it gives it a lot of energy. So uh, he had that plan and he sent me a bunch of songs that he had received in pre-production, about 400 songs. and. You know, I started listening to him, he was listening to them, but I put the whole first assembly together with no music at all, other than obviously the skating routines. They had they had music, but um, the rest of it, I didn't put any music on yet. Um, and I tend to do that a lot. I like keeping music out of the process as long as possible for a number of reasons. Um, I think music is incredibly powerful and so important that it can sway you very easily. And if you get swayed or locked into anything in the process too soon, in other words, if you have a scene and you put music on top, it, it'll, it'll work. I mean, it helps a lot. If you can make a scene work without any music at all, then you know you're absolutely golden when you put music on. And so it really forces you to be efficient and uh, brutal um, with, with editing process before the music gets put on. So that's what I did. I did the whole assembly without any music. Um, and then we, once we went through it for about a week or two, um, we then just started tossing songs on and um, trying to figure out what worked where, moved things around, tried this one there, that one there. Um, and we approached it hoping that we would get everything that we asked for, which is absurd most of the time and doesn't happen. And miraculously, we got almost everything. I don't know how they did it. Our music supervisor was just amazing. And um, and I think there's 40 some odd needle drops uh, in the film. And we got just about everything was our first choice uh, with one or two small exceptions. Um, and it was just a blast. And, and sometimes even there was, a, there were a couple of songs that we didn't get and then we ended up finding something even better. And that's always fun. It's like, wow, you know, um, it was just, it was remarkable. There were a few that I was worried that we weren't going to get, like the Fleetwood Mac song, The Chain, 
which I just love that whole sequence. It works so perfectly. Um, and I was, I would have been distraught if we couldn't have gotten that cleared. Um, so yeah, we just approached it as if, you know, uh, the world was our oyster and we could have anything. Um, and fortunately they came up with the, um, money and it, we screened it a lot for people too. You know, at first, a lot of, a lot of the music people had the same reaction. They would, um, get asked to clear the songs and their first response was no. And then Sue Jacobs, our, our music supervisor, just pushed and pushed and said, hey, watch the movie, just watch the movie and then you'll see. And then across the board, every single, you know, uh, uh, either artist or publisher or, or, you know, all the music people, once they watched it, uh, loved the movie also and signed off. I'm glad you got all of them. <laughs> yeah, nice. uh, there's also a, a mockumentary element to the movie. And uh, I mean, just thinking about, uh, the, you know, I mean, those moments in the movie are very stationary, um, very static, as opposed to the rest of the movie, which is very kind of fluid and, uh, you know, lots of movement and music and things like that. Was it difficult to incorporate those sequences into the movie? I mean, to, to not interrupt, I guess, the, the flow of it? Well, it was interesting. All of all of the there, there are basically three elements in, in the film um, that is, you know, narrative or interview. Uh, there, there's uh, the on-camera interviews, then there's the voiceover, and then there's the breaking the fourth wall. All of that material originally was scripted as just on-camera interviews, and that was one of the things that that Craig was very aware of. But when I first read the script, I, I said to him, I said, well, there are kind of a lot of talking heads in this movie, or, you know, is that going to be too much? And he right away was like, no, 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 this is going to be great. I'm going to shoot all kinds of other stuff and we'll use some as voiceover. And so then, <clears throat> then it really became a question of weaving that in and out and how is the best way to do that? So, um, you know, we would have some on camera and then we would kind of get into those or out of those with using it as voiceover. And then there was the element of breaking the fourth wall, which was a whole a whole other thing that um, w w I think just worked amazingly um, and emotionally, which was a concept again that Craig came up with that um, I thought was just really beautiful because it allows, it, it, he really wanted to do the, the, all of the violence in the film is so brutal and so harsh and he didn't want to sugarcoat that at all. It was really important because this is, this really, you know, allows us to see into Tanya's world. This is where she came from and it informed who her, who she, who she became. And it, it, he saw a documentary with her when she was very young at 15, there was actually a documentary done about her. And there was this moment where she was talking about her mother hitting her and, and she was very detached, which I think happens a lot with people who are in abusive situations. It's a survival mechanism and they detach and become very matter of fact. And, and he was really moved by this with her and he wanted to come up with some way of doing that in the film so that we could still have these really brutal sequences and yet show the fact that she survived them and, and show the reality of them and, and, but also show what it did to her emotionally. And that's when he came up with the breaking of the fourth wall. So you know, she gets slammed up against the wall or something and she turns and talks to the, to the audience and right there, you can see that she's detached emotionally on some subconscious you know, level to the audience. Um, it's also the older Tanya in, in narration talking to about what happened in the past. So again, it's a form of you know, the audience knowing that she survived. And it's just a very interesting and unique way. I mean, this film was, was I feel like we broke every rule. We sort of did a little bit of everything. You know, there's an interview, voiceover, breaking the fourth wall, split screens, freeze frames, skating sequences, dialogues. I mean, it was just, it's just a wild, wild ride and it was just remarkably fun to do. Uh, well, for your work, uh, you've received an Oscar nomination. You also won the American Cinema Editors Guild Award. Uh, I think it's your second victory yeah. at that guild. Uh, so tell us a little bit, of what does that recognition uh, mean for you? Well, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, both of those, uh, the, the Oscar nomination and the, and the Ace Eddie, both are, they're voted on by your peers. Um, and that, you know, Editing is such a mystery to most people anyway, that it's, it's a really difficult thing to vote for because um, 
you never know what the editor was given. You never know, you know, what how that dynamic works between the editor and the director and all of the politics involved and everything. But um, to have to have other editors um, acknowledge it in that way, the film and and my work is there's there's nothing nicer, you know, in a career to ha than to have that done. It's it's remarkable. I mean, I still um, honestly can't can't believe it. <laughs> I am pinching myself a lot. Well, it's a really great movie and uh, thank you so much. Uh, congratulations you. on your work. You bet. Thanks. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you as well. Thank you. Bye-bye.